From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, sheltering a place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to welcoming you back in our beautiful Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. We were originally scheduled to give a talk today and hear from Jeff Cowan, the Public Information Officer for Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. They were going to give us a talk on when a boat sinks, who is looking out for a pristine Lake Tahoe? Many people realize that Lake Tahoe is 6,200 feet above sea level and one of the most pure, clear, and pristine lake in the entire world. You can see down 75 feet uh, in Lake Tahoe water. That's an amazingly beautiful, clear body of water. So welcome, Jeff Cowan. While we were originally going to talk to you about uh, how you guys are keeping one of the most pristine lakes clean, we now, as time would have it, we're faced with a big emergency. The fires in Northern California have got soot, ash, and haze in the Bay Area, and you're even closer up in Tahoe. Show us some of the images of what's happening. Thank you so much, Ron, and everybody for having me. Uh, this is a real this is a real pleasure. I would give nothing more than to be with you in person as well, uh, to get out of the smoke, <laughs> to get out of the soot uh, and the ash that's, uh, that, that's inundating the area. This is the this is a new era in climate change for uh, forest management in the Western United States. Mega fires are becoming more and more common. And those are really critical to talking about watershed restoration and forest health up here in Tahoe. Um, uh, as a lot of you guys know, the Dixie fire is uh, the largest fire in, re in uh, California's recorded history. It's just north of us, but it was also the first fire to span the Sierra Nevada. It jumped from one side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range over to the other, first fire in recorded history to do that. But then a few weeks later, the second fire to cross over the Sierra Nevada, the Caldor fire, it erupted just down in Placerville, only about 45 minutes away from here. And that fire entered the Tahoe Basin about a week ago. And it's changed everything. We're all um, on edge, uh, 22,000 people in the south shore of the basin had to evacuate. And even today, as we speak, only about 67% of that fire is contained. A lot of people have been able to move back and come off of evacuation status. But um, this is a 219,000 acre wildfire. It's got 3,300 personnel working on it right now. That's down from about 5,000 people that were working on it a few weeks ago when it entered the, the Tahoe Basin. That night when it came into the basin, oh, it's just emotional to think about the neighborhoods that were threatened and the way the fire jumped right over neighborhoods that had fuel reduction projects and fuel reduction treatments that we have been working on for decades. Intense forest management that we've been able to conduct here in the Tahoe Basin allowed those firefighters to go into that neighborhood and to fight the fire head on. If we hadn't done defensible space, and fuel reduction around that neighborhood, um, then they wouldn't have even sent firefighters in. It essentially would have just wiped out um, thousands of homes. Already, uh, the Caldor fire um, has claimed about a thousand homes, but not in the Tahoe Basin, but these are surrounding communities around us that uh, consider themselves to really for Tahoe to be in their backyard. These are folks who, who um, considered like Tahoe to be part of their home. Uh, so when we're talking about forest management in the Tahoe Basin, you know, we are considering that this fire's impacts go well beyond what happened that night in Lake Tahoe when it came into the basin. Now, this was the first time ever that all of South Lake Tahoe has had to evacuate. This is a community of over 22,000 people. Uh, they were completely evacuated in about five hours, which is about how long the law enforcement and firefighters um, thought it would take. So they said that Tahoe dodged a big bullet. The environmental devastation that could have come from a catastrophic wildfire is really immeasurable because as you mentioned, our lake is so clean and so pure and so clear. And famously, Mark Twain, a famous American author, visited Lake Tahoe and he wrote um, how it felt like he was floating in a cloud when he was on a boat over the lake. And you could see a white dinner plate disappear at a hundred feet of depth. So um, we've lost a little bit of that from development practices um, back in the fifties and sixties at uh, my agencies been able to help help curb and help manage better. But a catastrophic wildfire that could push soot, ash, and significant erosion from uh, barren hillsides into the lake is, uh, is, is extremely concerning for us. And so it's one of the, forest management is one of the bigger things that we're working on. 
For our guests who are international and about half of uh, Wednesday Yachting Luncheon audiences are from outside America, let's give a few of the dimensions of Lake Tahoe. In Northern California, how far is it from San Francisco? How far is it from uh, Reno, Nevada? And yeah. what are the physical dimensions? It's about four hours drive out from San Francisco. It's about one hour from Reno, Nevada. And this, uh, this watershed's about 500 square miles. The lake surface is about 190 square miles. It's, it's over a thousand feet deep. It's one of the, uh, it's deepest point is 1600 feet. Um, sorry, I can't calculate that into meters right now. It is 39 trillion gallons of water, but the significant part of forest management and what we do even with, with watershed management and, and uh, managing watercraft on the lake is that there are two states that intersect the lake. There are five counties, there's one city there are state parks and national forest lands and um, uh, local community beaches. So managing recreation and the forest around the basin is a really broad mix of jurisdictions. And that's why the states came together about 50 years ago. And they everybody agreed that they had to have one agency, one organization that was doing land use planning, but was also the backbone for the restoration and the management of the environmental resources up here. Um, so this is really well known as a, as a recreation spot and boating is a, is a big part of that. We're also managed, you know, we have a lot of communities that are struggling. Um, housing in resort, a mountain resort towns like Tahoe is always challenging. And a lot of the, evacu- the residents who were evacuated, you know, these are folks who are struggling just to make ends meet. Um, uh, they were kind of rusted out older cars that were, you know, heaving with um, uh, belongings and possessions that were hurriedly packed that were on their way out of here. So uh, a lot of when we're talking about forest health and watershed management and restoration, you know, we are considering community health as well. It's the communities that are, are impoverished and struggling. They can invest in environmental restoration. They can invest in themselves. Um, so we do want to be cognizant of the fact that there are communities around the lake. There's about 45,000 private parcels around the lake, even though 85% of the land is in public ownership. Uh, that little 15% is, is uh, there's a lot of impacts that can come from that. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to kind of manage those areas. What's the population of Lake Tahoe year round? And what's the population seasonally? 60, 55,000 year round residents right now. And that's down significantly from uh, the 1990s and the, and the early 2000s when there was over 70,000 people that lived here annually. Now, there's a lot of second homes and there's a lot of tourism. Now, I can't tell you on a, on a daily rate what that jumps up to, but I can tell you that about 15 million re- uh, visitors a year come into the Tahoe Basin. And increasingly, the population centers around the, around the Lake Tahoe Bay, outside of the region are growing. And then we are really well known for skiing. There's about 13 major ski resorts all around the Tahoe Basin. Uh, there's about seven that are actually right on the, uh, that are really close to the water and can see the lake. It's a beautiful location for skiing. Um, so we do have some winter recreation. It pales in comparison to the summer recreation. The lake's, you know, really crisp and clean and cold. It'll get up to the 60s in the summertime and maybe the 70s really close to shore and shallower areas. But interestingly, the average year-round temperature of the water is about 39 degrees. So uh, we are a snow-fed high alpine lake. And where, where does the water exit from the lake and where is it going next? It is the, so there's only 63 tributaries feed in and one outlet, which is the Truckee River. Truckee River flows west toward California, but then it hooks east um, right around the town of Truckee, and it goes all the way out into a massive sink in the Nevada desert uh, called Pyramid Lake or the Pyramid Lake Basin. Uh, So this was the native watershed for the Washoe and the Shoshone people of northern Nevada and the Sierras. Um, uh, and Pyramid Lake was um, uh, really important culturally to them and its connection to Tahoe where they would come in the summers and they would fish and trap and uh, they would pick nuts and um, uh, try and sustain themselves through the winter with what they caught up here. So now describe to me how you first began to hear about the fires and began to be aware of what was going to happen in Tahoe, what you guys could do to make sure people were safe. Wildfire has been a part of the Sierra Nevada for a really long time, but we had a wake-up call in 2007. It was called the Angora Wildfire. This was a fire that was started by an illegal campfire. So the Caldor Fire burning right now, it spared all the homes in the basin. But the Angora Fire in 2007 wiped out 248 homes. Um, 
and it was only 3,100 acres. So the fire we're looking at today is 216,000 acres. It's huge. It's a mega fire. But a 3,100 acre fire took out 250 homes in the basin in the south end. And that was a real wake up call for everyone in the basin. You know, we can see what a catastrophic wildfire could do, not just to communities, but uh, could impact the lake and, and water quality and recreation experience and scenic um, qualities of the basin that we're really famous for. So we formed the Tahoe Fire and Fuels team. This is a massive collaboration. I talked about the, the mix of jurisdictions and land ownership and land management in the basin. Those are really typically challenging in a lot of areas. But we've turned that jurisdiction and that collaboration, that partnership into, into a benefit, into a strength of ours. Um, we reduced streamlined permitting processes between the two states and TRPA. We made defensible space and tree removal easier for property owners. We um, uh, started looking at rules on how you could use tractors and, uh, and heavy equipment in some of our sensitive stream zones to try and make it easier and faster to do fuel reduction projects in sensitive areas. But the collaboration really brought a lot more funding to the basin too. It's one of the benefits that we've had in Tahoe is that we're partnering so thoroughly and so well that we can cobble together funding from different sources. And it's been to great effect since 2007 in the basin, we've treated 67,000 acres. So these are halos around communities and neighborhoods. Um, uh, so they, they create what's called shaded fuel breaks. In firefighting terminology, a fire, the wildfire that's traveling quickly is a crown fire and it goes up on the tops of the trees. And if it gets into an area where people have gone in and manually taken out, selectively taken out trees and thinned the forest and removed ladder fuels and brush and small trees from underneath the, the canopy of the forest, then that fire will hit that spot and it'll lose energy and it'll drop down from 150 foot flames to 15 foot flames. And that allows firefighters to go in again and directly fight the fire. Um, and a lot of times the fire can put itself out and go around these neighborhoods and communities. So we've done 67,000 acres of those treatments, but there's been tens of thousands of defensible space projects done on private properties and homes. Um, and I, again, this is to great effect, but climate change is pushing the limits of what we have done to this point and what mega fires can do to destroy communities and destroy ecosystems like Lake Tahoe. So we created the Lake Tahoe Forest Action Plan. What the Forest Action Plan is doing right now is, is it's saying, okay, climate change is happening. What do we do to get ready? What do we do to prepare Tahoe's forests to become more resilient to the adapting you know, changes in the weather, how, what time of year precipitation comes, what, what form precipitation comes in, and, and what's happening with the constantly raising heat and the drying forces of, of climate change. So the Forest Action Plan is, is saying that we need to start looking a lot further away from those wildland urban interfaces or away from community halos and go deep, deep, deep into the forest. Okay, on the left, uh, for those who recognize it, that is the profile. That's the bird's eye view of Lake Tahoe. Tell us what the orange dots are around there, please. Those are fire ignitions. So these are ignitions that have happened between 2010 and 2017. So in just a seven-year period, over 350 wildfires ignited in the Tahoe Basin and were snuffed out so quickly that they didn't grow to more than a couple of acres. What's concerning 80% of those were human caused. What's the traditional way they're caused by humans? Illegal campfires and then an irresponsible use of bonfires and barbecues and things like that. Uh, sometimes, you know, in dry grass beds, you can pull your car off to the side of the road when it's been driving for four hours from San Francisco, let's say, and the catalytic converter is so hot that you park on a dry, dry weed and that'll start a fire. Um, uh, chains hanging from trailers can... Um, drag out the roadway, uh, this is specific to even boat trailers, you can drag on the roadway and throw sparks um, into the, the grass on the side of the road. Um, but honestly, for the most part, it's it's unauthorized campfires. And if a person saw a, a fire starting, I guess they'd call 911 right off the bat. Is that yeah. the right thing to do? Absolutely. 911. And then, you know, if you can take action, take action. You know, if you have a shovel around, start throwing some dirt on it. But uh, for the most part, it's uh, see something, say something is what we say in Tahoe all the time. If any of us sees a plume of smoke in our neighborhood or off in the wilderness somewhere, we all call 911 right away. And one of the things that the Forest Action Plan has helped us focus on investment in is technology like wildfire cameras um, set up all around the basin and all around the Sierra Nevada through partnerships with um, uh, universities and cooperative extensions 
And what these cameras can do is that they can actually use sort of uh, face recognition and um, uh, predictive technology and can alert uh, organizations and agencies and 911 officials even before some of us even see it. And describe the graphic on the right. That's another bird's eye view of Lake Tahoe. And talk about what the dark purple and the orange areas are, please. Well, every one of the shaded areas on the right over here is one of those initial fuel reduction treatments that I've talked about. Um, and these again are halos around communities. So the, the colors are just different. Or were they done by the state? Were they done by the Forest Service? Were they done by you know, private and local and local governments and landowners? And there's a lot of um, urban lots in Tahoe. This picture right here kind of shows you what we did in the 1960s and 70s to help protect Lake Tahoe from overdevelopment is that we went into and um, uh, the government started buying up vacant lands and parcels that were in the middle of communities to reduce the development potential of the basin. And so now those are you know, becoming fire hazards if they're not managed because they can get overgrown without regular either fire or regular thinning or having people around kind of developing parks in them. Um, so that's a really big picture of what we've done. Now, since 2007, almost 100% of those urban lots in the neighborhoods have all been had their initial treatment as well. So we've done a lot since 2007 working in partnership, but, um, but we know with climate change that we, that we need to do a lot more. And that those are, those are just initial treatments. So we're, we're looking to the future and more investment and uh, a much more intense management of the hinterland, let's call it the, the back country areas that are further away. Mega fires, if it, they happen in the basin and one could easily happen again this year, we're not out of fire season. The uh, incredibly dry and warm conditions that are in the Sierra Nevada and here in Tahoe right now are gonna continue um, um, even as they begin to extinguish with the Caldor fire. So um, uh, we're ramping things up as quickly as possible, but we know that we need more, so more support and more investment. And um, I'll just kind of throw this up and let you ask your question and we can get to that in a minute. Homeowners who have a place in Tahoe and they want to contribute to prevention of these massive fires, are you encouraging them to call you guys, call the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and learn what they can do with their own property and how they would thin the underbrush? What would you like homeowners to do? Yeah, defensible space is something that we encourage and every property on the basin should do. There's a lot that can be done without a permit. Um, uh, there are some uh, permitting requirements in Tahoe, but we've expanded that to be so that you can remove a, a tree 14 inches in diameter um, at about chest height without a permit. That's, that's, that's a lot of the problem trees that are on neighborhoods, but get a defensible space inspection from your fire district and then you don't need any permits. They'll come in, they'll mark any hazard trees. They'll look up at the canopy and they'll see what is the separation of canopy between the trees. And we've authorized them to do any tree removal necessary. Um, uh, so there's a lot you can do without a permit, but we do require um, no pine needles on the ground within five feet of structures. And then 30 feet away from structures is what we call the lean, clean and green zone. That's where the vegetation needs to be healthy, green, nothing dead, nothing dry, and nothing really tall ladder fuels, 15 foot trees and bushes that could like actually guide fire up into a, up into a tree. Um, so these are all things that we've supported and uh, uh, for a long time. Wood shake roofs. Um, a lot of second homes in Tahoe are kind of historic family cabins. And back in the day, the wood shake roof was rustic. It was inexpensive. Um, and, and a lot of people are kind of holding on to those because of the look and the feel of them. Incredibly dangerous roofs. Class A roofs today are composite, um, uh, composite tar tile or metal roofs. Um, and metal roofs you know, are also pretty attractive and they work well in snow conditions. Um, uh, those are a little bit expensive. I mean, those, you know, a lot of the stuff that, we, that we're talking about with defensible space, not cheap. So, um, so make a plan for how you're gonna get your defensible space done and, and stick to it and get it done and keep making those investments to make your property safer. Again, local fire protection district is gonna give you a free defensible space evaluation and you can do all of that work with no permits, no hassles at all, um, and um, and you can rake up pine needles. You know, so there's kind of legend, lore, and myth in the in the Tahoe Basin that TRPA and uh, or uh, water quality agencies required people to keep pine needles on the ground next to their house. It was it was it was never accurate, but um, that kind of myth, you know, it really paralyzes people. That kind of legend is something that we've tried mightily at the TRPA to get rid of, so that people know that they can do everything that they need to protect their homes. So. 
we've been hearing about sea level rise around the world and people in Florida are paying lots of attention to it. Urban areas, Manhattan, you know, pays attention to sea level rise. What about lake levels? Is there anything happening to the level of water in Tahoe as a result of what seems to be climate change? We are, so we're, so we're non-tidal, so we don't really have tides. We have, there is a 17 foot dam that was constructed back in the probably 1910s, 1920s over at the Truckee River. So the single outlet. Um, so that raised the, um, uh, the mean lake level up about 17 feet. So all the properties around the, around Tahoe now have piers constructed and floating platforms and things like that out considering that max elevation. More often, we're dropping below the natural rim of the lake. And the water stops really leaving if they want to keep the Truckee River alive and the fish and, and water going down into the agricultural lands that are further downstream, then they have to start pumping it out. Um, there's a limited amount that it can go down beyond that. But, but we're seeing more and more people are pushing their buoy fields or they're applying to get their buoy fields set out further or to um, uh, get their piers extended. And all of those things are part of the shoreline program that that um, that, that TRPA has been. We finally in, uh, adopted new shoreline rules in 2018. How much has lake level dropped in the last 20 years? Hey, it doesn't. It comes back up to full when we have a good winter, and it'll drop down below natural rim depending on the drought situation. I remember how incredibly deep Tahoe is. You said a thousand feet. Why is it so clear? Thank you for asking that. So it's an average depth of a thousand feet, which is insane. The, the deepest point is 1,600 feet. Um, you know, the lake follows the natural contour of the walls of the mountains around it. So if you see them shooting down, well, they get to the water and they keep shooting straight down. So we have areas right off of the West shore where you're in 1200 feet of water and you can throw a rock and hit the shore. Uh, pretty amazing place. And the bluest water in the world is the cleanest. It is the clearest. It is the most lacking in all organisms. So, so if you have a body of water that has very low nutrients and doesn't have a lot of stuff living in it, and it doesn't have any pollutants coming into it, then it gets bluer and bluer and bluer. Um, so that's why we are so blue is because we are crazy science word I'm going to throw out for the geeks is ultra oligotrophic. Oligotrophic means that it got very little nutrients and it's incredibly clear and clean and pure, but also ultra oligotrophic takes us to the next level of that. And then uh, what we're trying to do is avoid becoming eutrophic. Eutrophic lakes, they get to where they start holding on to enough nutrients to grow algae. The algae can start feeding itself. And then those are lakes that turn green and that are very cloudy and murky. Um, Clear Lake in um, uh, north of San Francisco is one that I can think of that's a eutrophic lake. Um, that may very well be a naturally eutrophic lake. It wasn't necessarily anything bad that happened to that lake. But um, uh, you get the different experience from different kinds of water bodies and different vegetation, different fish. Fishing in Tahoe, I can tell you from experience, is um, is fun and it, but it's limited because there's not a lot of food in the lake. Um, uh, so the so the fish only get up to about you know 20 pounds or so, and most of the fish are around two pounds. Uh, so that's the kind of the story of how blue, why blue. But I also want to kind of touch on Emerald Bay. So this right here is Emerald Bay, and there it's only about two miles long. There's a little boat camp right over here that you can actually, if you can get a booking for it. You camp uh, on the shoreline in a tent and you keep your boat right there. And of course, people are allowed to anchor up um, uh, behind this picture over on the western end of the, you can anchor up and you can camp in there. It's a really ideal spot. Um, it is in the southwest corner of the lake, very popular, lots of public lands, not a lot of development around there. But this is the mouth of the Emerald Bay and yellow and blue makes green. So we have incredibly blue water. We have yellow sand. So where the water is shallow enough for the sun to penetrate and to combine those two, we get really bright, really greens. Uh, so Emerald Bay was named Emerald Bay because of this stretch right here at the inlet is a bright, bright, bright greens. Very, very, very pretty. So talk about the age of Lake Tahoe. Millions of years old. I can't tell you off the top of my head. I can tell you that it's one of the few lakes in the Sierra Nevada, you know, that was not dammed, that was not formed by, um, by being manipulated, right? Um, the Sierra Nevada is a batholith. It's a giant piece of granite. It raised up out of the earth's crust and part of it split and fell away. And that fall away happened right here in Tahoe. Uh, the entire West shore is an escarpment. Um, uh, and then the East shore is the part that fell away. So this was a valley for millennia. Uh, who knows how long? I can't even tell you. And the river actually left out at North shore around like the middle of the North shore is a place called Kings beach. 
that's where the, the the valley exited out and it still went out to the to the sink in the Nevada desert. Uh, so the, yeah, so the lakes had a, a a long history, but I think that the first residents, uh, the first inhabitants were about 9,000 years ago. And that was the, the native Washoe tribe. Talk about the projection for the air clearing up, how we look ahead. What we're doing is we're trying to prepare and California is trying to prepare for a future of climate change and, and, uh, and forest health that Smoky conditions may become more and more and more normal as we get into drier conditions and drier forests. So we've had, you know, incredibly smoky periods last year. Um, uh, those amazing wildfires through the the the, um, the August complex and other massive blazes in Southern California that brought smoke into the basin for months. And then um, the Caldor fire and the Tamarack fire, which was just to the south of us earlier this year, those brought enormous amounts of smoke into the basin. Fire season in Northern Nevada and Northern California rather kind of like starts to peter out around October. Um, and then it picks up in Southern California and gets even heavier down there. So the air is clearer May, April, but new science is coming out showing that the impacts of wildfire on the lake, we've got nutrients like from ash and soot getting into the lake that would potentially help algae grow how you start to reduce the clarity of the lake just through particulate matter falling into the lake. But really importantly, clouding out the sunlight for significant periods of time changes the oxygen level in water bodies. And when the oxygen level changes, then a lot of the, um, the microorganisms and invertebrates start to um, wean off and die and their populations are reduced. Now, those are important to lake clarity because a lot of those microorganisms do eat algae and small particulates that help cloud the lake. Um, so we're still studying it. There's a lot to study about the Caldor fire that's burning right now and about those uh, fuel reduction treatments and how they worked and defensible space, how it worked, but also studying more about uh, wildfire impacts on our, on our ecosystem. We know that you know any erosion and ash going into the lake could hurt the lake. We've been developing watershed restoration and marsh and stream environment zone restoration projects for 50 years in Tahoe, specifically to try and clean the water before it gets into the lake to try and restore and maintain that historic clarity. Um, but there's, there's a lot more to do. Um, the future is, the future is changing and we just are going to adapt. So the yachting luncheon is always interested in yachting activity. Of course, can you describe yachting activity? Uh, do you have any sense about how many boats are on Tahoe and how many are power versus sail? Yeah. So we get about 15,000 unique boats launch every year. We have um, somewhere around, I think 4,000 um, uh, buoys, slips, and, and piers that can hold boats around the lake. There is a peak to it, right? Like how many boats can uh, get to every single ramp, launch, and marina around the lake and get launched in a day? Um, uh, so, there, so, so there is a limit to it. Yachting and specifically sailing on the lake is less popular than you would think. And it is because of the nature of our winds up here. We don't have steady, constant winds. They fluctuate a lot and they change direction really rapidly. So there are yacht clubs around the lake and there are sailing regattas and kind of um, beer can races, they call them down on South shore um, that, that happen with, with sailing, but we are not, a, we're, we're not a Mecca for sailing um, more and more, you know, it's, it's a clean, pure body of water. It's very refreshing and, and beautiful in the summertime. So as temperatures rise, we are becoming more popular for summer boating. Um, uh, but a lot of people don't want to haul their boat up here and we have a massive, um, uh, a threat of aquatic invasive species that we have watercraft inspections, mandatory watercraft inspections. There's there's a limit to how many boat rental concessions are on the lake because there's a, a cap on the number of buoys. There's a cap on the number of slips and, and piers. And that's part of our 2018 shoreline plan. How many buoys and how many slips? Uh, you're, you're challenging me here. I was ready to talk about the number of new buoys that can be allowed. We're allowing 3,300 new additional buoys over the next 20, 30 years and like a slow growth, we have an allocation uh, um, system letting maybe like a hundred a year, um, six piers a year can be built, um, uh, additional piers can be built. And I think there's about 172 piers um, and there's around 7,000 buoys right now. So we're looking at a potential for 10,000 buoys and then slips because we've capped, you know, there's no new marina construction, but uh, I think there's about two or 300 slips in the region. Most of those are in what's called the Tahoe Keys. Uh, the Tahoe Keys was um, uh, a land development that cut out a marsh 
in the South Shore. It was the, it was the largest march in the Sierra Nevada. Um, uh, and, you know, the environmental impacts of that, of that development were severe. Um, uh, but we are working with the homeowners in there to try and um, mitigate aquatic invasive weeds that have taken hold in there. And, um, uh, and developments like that are limited. So we won't be seeing any more marinas being created, but we do, we are allowing a few more hundred slips to be added where marinas can expand within their existing footprint. You mentioned um, shifting winds on Tahoe. I've sailed in Tahoe, and that's part of what happens in lakes. And that's actually, it makes for good sailors. If the wind direction keeps changing, people have to keep trimming their sails and uh, your trim cycle, you know, is shortened and that makes you a better sailor. Uh, and, and that's the same in lakes, in Lake Garda, in lakes in, in Georgia, Atlanta, lakes in the Midwest. It's always like that when you're on lakes, you know, the basins around the lakes redirect the wind. Yeah. Like sailing in Belvedere Cove is the same thing as sailing in a mini lake. And that's good for a sailing skill. It enhances sailing skill. And reading the wind and reading the water. Yeah. Right. You know, those are, yeah, th those are, those are challenging and a, and a newer skill, I think, in freshwater. Also, I had a powerboat in Tahoe for a while and I love the classic boats that you have, the classic oh motorboats. Incredibly yeah. beautiful. Several collections. I have some buddies with collections, and Tahoe has got some great, great collections. Boats fare better up here, you know, than uh, if you have a, a vintage boat that you've put a lot of money into restoration on and you want to protect it, then you want it to be in a really clear, um, a pristine environment and body of water. So, yes, you're absolutely right. A lot of those vintage boats are, um, are a part of Tahoe and a part of our, our history. Um, but I should probably kind of mention it because we've been talking about the limit on piers and, and boats and things like that. And I, and, and, and I think that that's not really something that a lot of other water bodies talk about. So I wanted to kind of explain the reason why. Lake Tahoe is an outstanding national resource water body. It's just, this is a status that's, that's um, um, uh, uh, bestowed upon water bodies by the, by the US EPA. Um, and with that non-degradation standard, we have to measure pollutants and we set a threshold for pollutants and um, uh, motorized watercrafts provide pollutants. So, um, when we talk about increasing the, the uh, increasing boating capacity and boating on Lake Tahoe, we're all for it. Boating is a really important part of our economy and our culture and the history, and we're all for it. But if it does provide impacts to water quality and to and, and to pollutants and to the pollutant load in the lake, then we need to look at mitigating that. And so the first step that we took was actually in the 1990s. Um, TRPA in Lake Tahoe was the first region to ban carbureted two-stroke engines. Many, many lakes went followed suit immediately afterwards. We kind of like set a precedent and, 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 and a first in the country. And it was really interesting that the watercraft industry pivoted right away. They started making um, uh, fuel-injected um, two-strokes and they started making a lot more sea uh with four-stroke engines. So, so it helped clean the industry up, but we saw a significant reduction in hydrocarbons um, uh, that were being measured in the lake, specifically in Emerald Bay, you know, that area that we showed um, that's so popular with boaters. I mean, it's pretty much, it's a beeline destination. When you rent a boat or you launch on Lake Tahoe, if you're close enough, the first place you want to go is Lake Tahoe because it is so beautiful. It reminds people of the fjords of Norway with these sharp granite cliffs, just like rising straight up out of the water. And then that little tea house you saw on the island there, that was actually a, um, a Norse um, architectural design by um, uh, a woman who owned the Emerald Bay back in the 1940s. Um, uh, her son was an architect, designed her home in that tea house on um, uh, Viking kind of style construction. Anyway, so so in Emerald Bay itself, uh, when we um, banned carbureted two-stroke uh, engines, immediately massive reductions in, in hydrocarbons that were being measured in that intensely used kind of uh, water body. So but you know, boats can have a lot of other impacts on the lake. Uh, we talked about aquatic invasive species, but but placing moorings and mooring blocks and piers in on um, cobble beds on uh, rocky on rocky bottoms, those are uh, fish spawning grounds for a lot of the fish that are in the lake. Um, uh, so we need to be sure like that we're not impacting those. And uh, marinas can dredge, and um, they have to dredge every year. And if marinas have to dredge every year, then they're causing um, uh, silt um, buildup and clouding of the lake and, and, and sediment moving. And then those littoral drift patterns can be changed by piers um, uh, that will change the shape of the shoreline and it'll change, um, again, fish habitat zones and recreation can change from uh, if you start to lose beach because if beach replenishment isn't happening, 
as piers are being built and breakwaters are being built around the lake. So I just wanted to say that we don't limit boating to limit the number of people that are on the lake. Um, uh, but we, but we do have to make sure that those, those, um, that the lake's protected. So sand is created by eons of waves up on beaches. How do you get sand in Tahoe? It's granite and it's very soft granite and it's decomposed granite. Um, yeah. So we've got no shortage of sandy beaches, but it's very coarse. I can tell you from, you know, spending time on the ocean, obviously the ocean beaches are a lot more comfortable, um, to lay on and to play in than our beaches. Um, we still have that, that, um, that beautiful looking uh, beach, the sandy beaches are still part of, are, are part of our ecosystem. So electric engines are taking hold in the Bay Area. Some sailboats have electric engines. And I even uh, recently took a ride and we had as a guest speaker, someone who bought uh, one of the first electric foiling outboard motorboats in San Francisco, <clears throat> foiling around in the Bay at 30 knots. Uh, electric foiling, that combination. Are you seeing any electric boats up in Tahoe? Yeah, so we've actually helped kind of like streamline some permit processes for electric charging stations at Homewood Marina over on the West Shore. Um, and we got to go out on one of their um, electric ski boats, uh, uh, wakeboard boats. And of course, you know, e-foiling uh, for uh, wakeboards, they're kind of like a surfboard like with an e-foil on it, right? Um, yeah. uh, those are really picking up really, um, really well too. So there is a lot of um, hope for the future with um, electric um, propulsion and electric to, and battery technology as it gets better. And then, you know, the, I mean, the noise reduction from that electric wakeboard boat that I, that I got to take a ride on earlier this summer was really huge. And then there, without the engine running and without the engine ma- creating so much noise, they can actually turn their stereo down. They don't have to have their stereo turned up as loud. Um, uh, there's really interesting compounding um, uh, benefits from from some of that new technology coming online. but. But we're not to a point yet where you know we're 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 ready to start you know considering those mitigations in our shoreline permitting program. They may be something in the future, but um, uh, I'm really glad you brought that up about how technology can improve some of our uh, environmental protections. So the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency is 50 years old. How big is it? What's your annual budget? We're just under 20 million, and a lot of that's um, categorical grant funds that are specifically aimed at uh, programs and projects like transportation. And I talked about aquatic invasive species in our watercraft inspection program. That's a big grant funded program that's um, about 50% grants, 50% from fees. But I mean, as an organization, we're about 70 people. I think that when we look at the collaboration and the partnership of all the organizations in the basin, there's about 80 different organizations from the Forest Service down to a public utility district that we partner with and through a program called the, the Environmental Improvement Program. Um, this is a massive watershed restoration program that was actually um, kicked off in the 1990s, 1997, by uh, when President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore came to Tahoe and signed the Lake Tahoe Restoration Act. It really started kind of bringing in more federal funding to the basin uh, to match all of the local funding, the local spending that we were doing on buying up uh, private private land and restoring it, uh, restoring marshes, meadows, and wetlands back to their natural state so that they can help help clean the water. So programs like that, um, that's the environmental improvement program. So we're a smaller organization agency and we're neither fish nor fowl. We're a bi-state agency um, uh, that a, a lot of people kind of, they approach us at first and they think, what are you exactly? But then when they get to know us, what we are is that we're, we're a collaborator and we're a partnership building agency, really. And so what are the objectives of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency? And tell us what's a good year and what's a bad year. Yeah, really good question. So we have environmental threshold carrying capacities were a concept back in the 1970s. And they were actually mandated in our compact. They were like, they, they gave us 10 environmental threshold ca- ca- carrying capacities and said in wildlife, you know, um, uh, aquatic water quality, air quality, transportation, and you just go down the list, fisheries. So we measure them, we set the goal, we say we want our uh, water quality to get back to 100 feet, let's say. Um, and then within that, we set um, a specific measurement standards and where we have a regional plan that is uh, designed to achieve those standards. The regional plan is mostly regulatory. We have land use organi- uh, um, ordinances that were kind of I think that that's one of the things that we're probably most known for is like limiting coverage, the amount of the size of a development that you can have. We set standards. We said you can only have um, 55,000 homes. You can only have this many, this uh, square feet of commercial floor area in the basin. We haven't hit those yet. We're still growing, but it's very, very slow growth. 
in the 1970s when we were created, I mean, the growth was out of hand. They were, you know, they were carving in subdivisions and tracts of land. So subdivisions have been prohibited and banned. And also no new roadways can be built in the basin. The roadway capacity has to stay where it is. Um, we need to uh, keep doing a better job of transit and transportation in order to meet our air quality goals. Um, so we can't, we can't grow our way out of any of our problems. Um, and we need to keep reinvesting in the, in, in the land that we have to try and um, uh, get affordable housing to support you know, a, a good, strong economy. So given your uh, sort of environmental objectives, what would a good year look like? Give me, tell me if, if the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency said, this is a good year, tell me yeah. what uh, would, would be, we'd see. Oh, more acres of forest fuel reduction, more acres treated, more defensible space on properties, but then also more restoration of uh, linear feet of shore of a uh, shoreline, getting more shoreline from private ownership back into pu into public ownership into public hands to improve recreation. Uh, we would see more people riding transit. Um, uh, there would be less parking at recreation areas and better air quality and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We would see. Um, older homes being upgraded and updated to newer standards where they're more efficient with, for heat and they're creating a, a smaller carbon footprint, but they're also doing erosion control. They're actually doing water quality um, protections at the, at the parcel level, um, controlling erosion and sediment off of their paved surfaces. We would love to see in, you know, improvements in water clarity. So to see that water clarity number go from 70 feet to 75 feet to 80 feet, you know, those would be really good years um, uh, for the basin. But but with but with weather patterns and precipitation fluctuations, we actually have had really good years in the last in the last 20 years. We've seen the average clarity get down to 80 feet, um, uh, and even in winter time when there's very few nutrients coming into the lake, we can see the water clarity get down to 100 feet. But it's the year-round average that matters to us. That's the average that shows the actual overall health of the watershed. So give us the metrics around the drought. What stage are we in droughtness and uh, how dry? Can you see any trends? So we are in a mega drought that is, you know, uh, the West is in a mega drought right now, which is, you know, a drought that lasts more than 10 years. Um, so we have been in drought status for more than 10 years. The fuels uh, in the Sierra Nevada are the driest in recorded history. Um, uh, so they've never measured fuels on average to be drier than they are right now. And they are 95% dry. And um, the ignition potential is between 85 and 90% on most days in the Sierra Nevada right now, especially here in Tahoe. That means if you were to cast, if you were to light and throw hundred matches, that 90 of them would start a fire. Um, uh, so, so, so that's where we are in the drought. You know, we don't, so water quantity here in Tahoe is, is a different animal. Like we don't have water quantity issues, but we do have water quality issues because, you know, the, the lake and the watershed is snow fed and it's not dammed, but it's not our biggest issue. What our biggest issue is, is um, what are the droughts impacts on forest health? Our forest action plan, if we were to go through and treat the size and the acres of the forest that we're talking about, we would have more groundwater recharge. There's be fewer trees taking water out of the ecosystem and it would create more water um, at the bottom of the watershed. And, um, and that could help actually um, uh, make for our forest to be wetter for more of the year. In Marin County, we're getting way into, you know, drip irrigation and gray water reusage and so on. What's going on on those fronts in Tahoe? We're, again, our, so our public utility districts that manage water consumption in the basin, most of them are in California and they're and they follow California law um, to try and make our, you know, all of our houses and homes more efficient and to reduce our water consumption. We have, we're limited on irrigation. I can only water three days, you know, three, three days a week. And there were turf buyback programs that I participated in that got more drip irrigation onto our property. But what, because of that outstanding national resource water designation and a, no, uh, de, um, a zero water degradation standard for the basin, then we are not talking about gray water reuse um, because of the amount of nutrients that are in that stuff and um, uh, the potential for spillage um, that, 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 that exists with it. So, but we also have the Porter Cologne Act. The Porter Cologne Act in California required that all effluent in the basin get transported out of the basin. So we don't treat any base, any of our own effluent, gray water or black water in the basin here. It all gets treated initially and it gets pumped out over Luther Pass to the south and into Alpine County, which, uh, and it goes to farms in the Walker River drainage. 
Um, so that was again, and then taught and then the Nevada side of the lake, they have a very similar legislation that requires them to have zero um, uh, wastewater treatment maintained in the basin. So all of our effluent is transported out of the basin. And again, because of the high level of nutrients, because of what was happening in the basin with um, nutrient loading in the 1960s and more algae growth um, that, and more nutrients entering the lake. So, so we are a little bit different in that way. So you got 70 folks, uh, diligent folks in the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. Give us the org structure and tell us uh, what are the groups of people? Well, I, you know, I think a big shout out to our governing board initially, because we are a bi-state compact agency. So we have to have a 15 member governing board. Now, 14 of those are, are, are um, 14 of those are voting members. The 15th is a presidential appointee. That's a non-voting, um, that's advisory, but it's split down the middle. There's seven from Nevada and seven from California and local jurisdictions, each of the counties, they appoint uh, someone from their uh, county supervisor or city council. And then, um, and then the states have um, senatorial, have legislative appointees, and gubernatorial appointees. Um, so we have a really great mix of, of, um, of leaders and decision makers on our governing board um, that, are, that just provide you know, the right perspective. It's not just local people making the decisions. It's not just state, it's not just federal people making the decisions. It's, um, it's, it's back to that collaborative and partnership model. Um, so we have only one lawyer. We have about three compliance inspectors for the whole basin. So we, we partner up with local jurisdictions to do a lot of our site inspections. Um, and, and we have a lot of GIS people, geographic information systems. So these are folks who basically work with digital maps and digital mapping. They take satellite radar and LIDAR data, uh, light imaging um, uh, data, and, um, and they'll create overlays and they'll share that with our partners to help fuel reduction projects, to water, water quality projects, stream restoration projects, things like that. Um, so we have a lot of GIS, the technical side of folks, and, and we have permitting uh, folks, people who are writing the permits for property owners to do construction for big, big construction projects for even watershed restoration projects um, come under a permit and forest health comes under a permit as well. Um, community, and then, you know, the rest is the administration, the, the administrative side. So thank you very much, Jeff, for giving us a review of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. You guys are diligently working to keep one of the purest, cleanest lakes in the world uh, beautiful and pristine. And uh, thanks for telling us how you're mitigating the pending danger caused by the fires that have been going on in Northern California. Every time I go to Tahoe, I'm blown away by how beautiful it is. Great to know that you've got a force of 70 uh, trying to keep the lake famously beautiful. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time, Ron. Have a good one. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.